Welcome. Today we are going to talk about Chapter 3 of Johannes Climacus's Philosophical Fragments, where Kierkegaard is going to talk about the absolute paradox. We're turning our attention to Chapter 3, the absolute paradox, or a metaphysical caprice. We've noticed that each of these three chapters so far are trying to take a different tact in understanding this large question, the thought project that was brought to us in the, in the first chapter, the question of whether or not the truth can be learned, and if so, from a non-Socratic point of view, how should we do that? Chapter two was this poetical venture. It was much more of a narrative form and, and used that whole analogy that we've already addressed with the, the king and the maiden and that whole question. Uh, but was really getting to those issues of the learner and the teacher, and what does that look like from the non-Socratic point of view. In chapter three, we're turning our attention to the question of the absolute paradox, a metaphysical caprice, uh, as Kierkegaard is addressing. The paradox becomes one of those essential ideas for Kierkegaard's existentialism, while other atheist existentialists might argue for things like the absurd of why are we doing anything life is absurd without meaning Camus for instance would argue this Kierkegaard as a theistic existentialist doesn't have a notion of absurdity but instead talks about things like a paradox how can one thing be the same as the other now before even getting into it the absurd and the paradox are almost the same thing. But for the absurd and Camus, it's absurdity because there is no God and therefore there is no meaning. For Kierkegaard, it's a paradox because things might seem empty and yet are full. And moving off of that, right? So before even getting into this chapter, we're introduced to a term and an idea that's going to have decisive significance for Kierkegaard in his notion of existentialism as the father of existentialism and this idea about your choices and decisions. And it all results down to this idea of a paradox, how things are not to be and to be simultaneously in the act of learning. And how does this work? So let's start off here on page 37 at the beginning. Although Socrates did his very best to gain knowledge of human nature and to know himself, yes, even though he has been eulogized for centuries as the person who certainly knew man best, he nevertheless admitted that the reason he was disinclined to ponder the nature of such creatures as Pegasus or Gorgons was that he still was not quite clear about himself. Whether he, as a connoisseur of human nature, was a more curious monster than Typhon or a friendlier and simpler being by nature, shared something divine. This seems to be a paradox, but one must not think ill of the paradox, for the paradox is the passion of thought, and the thinker without the paradox is like the lover without passion, a mediocre fellow. So right here we're introduced a little taste of what this paradox is and we're told that it's not knowing who you are but yet knowing more about everybody in the case of Socrates and that we shouldn't think something ill for the ignorance but rather this paradox is what makes life worth living right it, it's it's the passion for the lover otherwise you're just a mediocre fellow Continuing, but the ultimate potentiation of every passion is always to will its own downfall. This is the potential result of the passions as understood philosophically. These inclinations that we share that might take you over and therefore cause their own downfall. And this is the risk that we have. And so it is also the ultimate passion of the understanding to will the collision Although in one way or another, the collision must become its downfall. So we're going to have, with our desire to know ourselves, our own downfall 
But we have to do that because that's the only place that knowledge can be found, right? This whole idea of knowing yourself and moving and proceeding as such. Kierkegaard then spells out very clearly what this paradox is. This then is the ultimate paradox of thought, to want to discover something that thought itself cannot think. How can you think what can't be thought? And yet this is what you want to think. This is the purpose and passion of the mind is to move beyond the limits of mind. Now, we have this sort of interesting touchback and, and throwback to people like Kant, right? Where we're gonna try to understand the limits of our mind, right? That the mind can't correspond its own limits. That's the one thing that the mind can't understand, right? We have this sort of touch base back there. Uh, and you can kind of tease this out in some of the Kantian philosophy as well. It's not exactly where he's going in its entirety, but this is where he's looking at. And again, he's using Socrates as this example of somebody who might have known human nature better than anybody else, or at least philosophically, this is what's postulated, and yet didn't really believe he knew himself fully. You don't know the limits of your own understanding. That's one thing you, your understanding can't do. This passion of thought is fundamentally present everywhere in thought. Also, in the single individual's thought, insofar as he, thinking, is not merely himself. When you're thinking, you're moving outside of yourself. You're looking at things differently. Now, we can also draw a very easy connection here with this notion of the paradox with Hegel and his whole master-slave dialectic that we were addressing before. The master-slave distinction that we have with Hegel, that right there's the object and the subject, and your mind is two, but one then takes over and is in charge of the other, and that's what makes this driving force, and that one becomes how you look at yourself, but you are both. Here, this is not what Kierkegaard would argue. In fact, in some ways, this might be seen as a correction or a critique of Hegel, in that Kierkegaard is saying we're looking for what we don't know, which is always on the outside. That it's the outside that becomes the reflection for ourselves, not a second essence within ourselves, as Hegel was postulating. Right, so it's a different sort of idea. We're borrowing a little bit from Socrates, we're borrowing a little bit from Kant, we're borrowing a little bit from Hegel, and we're producing something new, where thought wants to think what thought cannot think. We're trying to have an unthinkable thought. We're trying to move beyond the limits of our mind with our mind, right? And this is where we get into this metaphysical idea, right? This is, what type of metaphysics are we addressing? Well, it's, it seems that the metaphysics we're addressing is less philosophical and more transcendental, but grounded in philosophical notions of metaphysics, right? So uh, again, it's, it's a little hard to get there, but we're seeing some common threads and connections we have with others throughout this time. But because of habit, we do not discover this. Because of our habits, because of our lives, we're not able to understand what we don't understand. We don't understand the process of our thought. Similarly, the human act of walking, so the natural scientists inform us, is a continuous falling but good steady citizen who walks in his office mornings and at home in midday probably considers this an exaggeration because his progress, after all, is a matter of mediation. How could it occur to him that he is continually falling, he who unswervingly follows his nose? Right? There's this sort of interesting analogy at the time of walking, right? that you're always falling, but yet you're, you're stopping your fall. That's what your next foot is going to do. If your other foot was pulled back, you would fall all the way down. Obits, objects in space orbit, uh, right? The, a satellite orbits whatever the object it is that it's orbiting. It's always falling, but has enough advancement that it doesn't degrade its orbit unless the propulsion slows down too much, and then it does, right? 
But this is the sort of challenge that we're going to be talking about. This is the, the movement that he's addressing here is that things don't seem to make sense but might actually be the case and that this becomes the object of learning is you're always trying to strive beyond what you know even though you don't know what you don't know uh, and that you don't know that you're trying to do it you know moving on to 38 he says but in order to get started let us make a bold proposition let us assume that we know what a human being is now, this is actually a fairly bold proposition that we're just going to start right here in the middle that we assume what we're doing right this is very hegelian right you got to just jump in the stream you don't know you can't go back and analyze everything to death you just got to jump in and know it it's also assuming at least in part some sort of conclusion of this whole debate we had of universals with people like abelard and william of champeau and everyone else who was engaged in this debate, uh, Bernard and others, right? That can we predicate a thing about a thing? Do we know what a human being is or can we only know what an individual man is? Right, so Kierkegaard is taking a very Hegelian approach to this Abelardian question. We're just gonna dive in. We're just gonna make the assumption that we know what a human being he even kind of tilts his hat at the just oddity of, of being able to do this in the little footnote, he says. Perhaps it seems ludicrous to want to give this thesis the form of doubt by assuming it. For after all, in our theocentric age, everyone knows such things. Would that it were so. Democritus also knew it, for he defines man thus, man is what we all know. And continues, for we all know what a dog, a horse, a plant, etc. are, but a human being is none of these. We shall not be as malicious as Sextus Empiricus, nor are we as witty for he, as we know quite correctly, concluded, from that man is a dog, for a man is what we all know, and we know what a dog is, ergo, not a dog. Right. We shall not be as malicious, but I still wonder if our age, the matter has been clarified in such a way that it does not in need to feel a bit uneasy about itself at the thought of poor Socrates and his awkward position. We're finding ourselves in this weird sort of position to try to say, what is a man? Let's just assume we know what it is. Let's assume this universal question is regarded that we can say something sorry Abelard that we might be able to predicate something about a thing now that doesn't necessarily mean that we're agreeing with the argument being made by Anselm very platonic or you know shampoo that there are universals found everywhere but we have to have a starting point for our investigation so we're going to assume as Hegel would prompt us to do, to just jump in and discuss these things. In this, we do indeed have a criterion of truth. Right? Once we decide we know we're going to assume what a human being is, we have this as the basis of what we can bounce other things off of. We have this as the criteria of truth that is it a man, is it a dog, is it a whatever, right? This is what's introduced, this is what's known which he continues all greek philosophy sought or doubted or postulated or brought to fruition and it is not noteworthy is it not noteworthy that the greeks were like this is it not so to speak a brief summary of the meaning of the greek mentality an epigram as it is written about itself by which is better served than by sometimes prolix works about it thus the proposition is worth assuming and for another reason as well since we have already explained it in the two previous chapters we've already explained a little bit about what humanity is in that a human being is the learner 
in this expense, right? So we've already laid the groundwork. We're already gonna make the assumption that the learner is the object who wants to learn the truth, but yet is opposed to the truth and is untruth. We've already taken these sort of ideas in the previous chapters, and so now we're able to add on to that. We're gonna assume that it's true for the time being. Maybe we'll come back and we'll challenge these, or we'll even look at it and try to understand what things are. But we're gonna start with this idea. We're wanting to uh, understand the idea of learning. If the Socratic theory of recollection and of every human being is universal man is not maintained, then Sextus Empiricus stands there ready to make his transition implied in to learn, not merely difficult, but impossible. And Protagoras begins where he left off with everything as the measure of a man. In the sense that he is the measure of others, but by no means in the Socratic sense that the single individual is for himself, the measure, no more and no less. We know then, chapter at the bottom of our paragraph new, at page 38, what man is in this wisdom, the worth of which I, at least of all, will denigrate, can continually become richer and more meaningful, and hence the truth also. And then, the understanding stands still, as did Socrates. For now the understanding's paradoxical passion that wills the collision awakens, and without really understanding itself, wills its own downfall. Once we understand man as the learner, as we've established in those previous two chapters, we know that the learner wants to learn the objects outside of itself, but in so doing is this collision of thought and a transition of self from not to be to to be. And yet this is the only place that we can be at. We're willing our own downfall. Our excitement is at our destruction, or at least our transformation, which the other is lost but not gone, right? That this, this sort of odd sort of paradox again. Top of 39. But it is the same with the paradox of erotic love. A person lives undisturbed in himself and then awakens the paradox of self-love as love for another, for one missing, right? This is what happens with love. You're all happy to be yourself and to be, you know, in charge of yourself and your life, all contented in yourself. But then you're awakened by love for somebody else. And you care about them as much or more than you care for yourself. And this is of course paradoxical because what is this? What is this love? What is this transformation? I'm willing that I'm sacrificing myself for others. That seems counterintuitive. It seems very counter to Plato's notion of the story of egoism in the Ring of Gyges, right? That, that there's love for others means it's sacrificial, that it's giving. But yet, most of us would say that this is indeed the case. Following on, just as the lover is changed by this paradox of love, so that he almost does not recognize himself anymore, so also that intimated paradox of the understanding reacts upon a person and upon his self-knowledge, in such a way that he who believed that he knew himself now no longer is sure whether he perhaps is more curiously complex animal than Typhon or whether he was in his being a gentler and diviner part. But this is what love does. Love takes you from your current position and shakes you up and makes you lose who you are in this moment only to then become something new something more complex, more full. You're not sure where you are in this because you're not the same as you were before, but there's some element of this, right? We're, we're seeing this fantastic Hegelian synthesis of the dialectic uh, in the notion of love, right? You have the lover, you have the beloved, and you have the transformation in the lover towards the beloved in a creation of this new lover 
as it were, right? To, to do thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and this object, right? The self, that outside of itself, and this new love produced, creating this new thing as a result of it. Continuing on at that bottom paragraph on page 39. But what is this unknown against which the understanding in its paradoxical passion collides, and which even disturbs man and his self-knowledge? What is this thing that disturbs us or changes you? Well, what did he say the paradox is? The paradox is trying to think what thought cannot think. You're always thinking about what? The point of learning is that you're going beyond what you know. Otherwise, it's just Socratic recollection, right? So uh, clearly, that which we are trying to gain is stated very clearly. It is the unknown. The whole point here is that we have the unknown, and this is what we're trying to assume. This is what the product of learning is. Again, otherwise we return to the Socratic notion of simply recollecting. But it is not a human being because you know what this is or something of that, right? So it's not truly unknown. Therefore, let us call the unknown the God. Again, this is a, a, a term, but now we're defining God not just as this sort of king in the, the narrative poetic chapter two but in this metaphysical idea of that object which is other and different and unknown now what's really neat here is if we understand language the root of the word holy that's being used is other it's different that's what this word means when somebody refers to god or, or an object is holy is that it's different it's got a different characteristic in other words it's something different than what i know and what i am it is the other so for climacus slash kierkegaard to call the unknown the god is really just a continuation of this purpose of what the term holy the major characteristic of what god is to this application we're normalizing what the unknown is. The unknown, therefore, is the other. And the ultimate other is that which doesn't share what we have and is therefore completely unknown to us, at least as it begins, would be the God. He points out it is only the name we give it. It hardly occurs to the understanding to want to demonstrate that this known, unknown, the God exists. It really doesn't need a proof, right? This becomes the sort of starting point of, of Kierkegaard's idea of proofs for the existence of God is, well, if God is simply holy, and holy means other, and therefore it is unknown, it's not really needed logically to conclude that we even need a proof that God exists because we already all assume that there are things that we don't know that is other, that is outside of ourselves. Now, if you're a complete solipsistic, you know, it's all about you guy, then maybe this needs to be, you know, proved to you. But we have to assume that there is something out there, right? So it's very similar in some ways to Anselm's proof for the existence of God, right? This ontological argument, God is than that which nothing greater can be conceived. Here, Kierkegaard says, God is that which is unknown. And the fact that you don't know all proves that there's a God. I mean, it's it's very similar ontological basis. Now, this might not be a valid proof, but he's just saying it's it doesn't even consider that you need to prove it. If namely, he continues, the God does not exist, then of course it is impossible to demonstrate it. But if he does exist, then it is foolishness to want to demonstrate it, since I, in the very moment the demonstration commences, would presuppose it is not as doubtful, which a presupposition cannot be inasmuch as it is a presupposition. 
but as decided, because otherwise I would not begin, easily perceiving that the whole thing would be impossible if he did not exist. Right? Why is it we're doing even engaged in the idea of proofs for the existence of God? To confirm your lack of belief or confirm your belief. The fact that you started the argument means that you're just explaining what it is you believe and you're not actually proving something to what would validate anyone else's idea. This is one of the, going back to Kant, right? Kant really didn't like a lot of the proofs for the existence of God. He didn't think that they worked. He didn't think that they proved things. Now, Kant believed in God. He just wasn't sure that the proofs worked because you're already just confirming what it is you're starting to assume. By the way, this could be a process for a lot of our thinking that we're just confirming what we know and we're not truly approaching what is unknown or couldn't do so from an unbiased perspective. If, however, I interpret the expression to demonstrate the existence of God, now on page 40, to mean that I want to demonstrate that the unknown which exists is the God, then I do not express myself very felicitously. For then I demonstrate nothing, least of all an existence, but I develop the definition of a concept. Right? This is what the definition does, right? This is Kant's critique for ontological arguments, right? My three-sided object doesn't necessarily exist, but if it does, then it's a triangle. Conversely, a triangle, a three object, right? That what we're doing is we're developing the definition of something, but we're not proving its existence. And so we're once again getting to Kant's critique of an ontological argument, though, from a different perspective, without it being so clearly, as Kant said, blah, 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 right? And this is the, the funness that we have of, of Kierkegaard in this work. He continues, it is generally a difficult matter to want to demonstrate that something exists. Worse still, for the brave souls who venture to do it, the difficulty is of such a kind uh, that fame by no means awaits those who are preoccupied by it. The whole process of demonstration continually becomes something entirely different, becomes an expanded concluding development of what I conclude from having presupposed the object of investigation exists. Therefore, whether I am moving in the world of sensible palpability or in a world of thought, ah, now we see this connection with Anselm, right? Are we talking about what is better to exist in thought or in reality, it's sensible palpability or only in thought, right? That, that's a clear little, hey, I'm talking about that, right? I never reason in conclusion to the existence, but I reason in conclusion from existence. For example, I do not demonstrate that a stone exists, but that something that exists is a stone. Back to Kant, right? The court of law does not demonstrate that a criminal exists, but that the accused who does exist is a criminal. Whether one wants to call existence an ascension or an eternal prius, uh, presupposition, it can never be demonstrated. We shall take our time after all. There is no reason for us to rush there. It is for those who, on the uh, concern for themselves, or for the God, or for something else, must rush to get a proof that something exists. But in that case, there's no good reason to make haste, especially if the one involved has in all honesty made an accounting of the danger that he himself, or the object being investigated, does not exist. Until he proves it, and does not dishonestly harbor the secret thought that essentially it exists, whether he demonstrates it or not. What's interesting here is that we can see a sort of connection to Descartes and his meditations as well. That we're, we might even say, I'm going to table the thought that this exists, or maybe even that it doesn't exist. But we are also, in some ways, going back and returning to the confirmation that it does indeed exist. And, and this is what Descartes did in his meditations. And so we're very much connecting this idea and going back to what we already assumed to be the case. Even if we're going to say that I'm going to start off with the assumption that it isn't the case, because you already believe it's true. So 
proofs don't really work in this way or they're not a fruitful venture. Continuing on at the bottom of page 40. If one wanted to demonstrate Napoleon's existence from Napoleon's works, would it not be most curious, since his existence certainly explains his works, but the works do not demonstrate his existence, unless I have already in advance interpreted the word his in such a way as to have assumed that he exists. So what we find ourselves doing is now moving from an ontological argument to addressing issues of the cosmological argument. But he's going to say, in very similar manner to what Kant does, by the way, that the basis of a cosmological argument is back to that issue of an ontological argument. Right? We might have works that are done. We might have stones that exist. We might have battles that have been won in the case of Napoleon. But we're going to assume from the defeat, the victory, the existence of an object that whatever it is that we're presupposing to exist was the cause of that, right? So we're going back to this idea of an ontological argument, even though we're trying to shift towards a cosmological one. But, here's a, a very large but, Napoleon is only an individual. And to that extent, there is no absolute relation between him and his works. Someone else could have done the same works. Anyone else could have done what Napoleon did. In fact, many of the things that Napoleon did, other characters throughout history have done. Different people could have also been the one who did it instead of Napoleon. It could have been uh, an imposter. It could have been uh, a copycat. Napoleon could have been homesick and, and somebody else led the charge or, or decided, hey, let's go invade Russia in the middle of winter. Bad idea, by the way. Top of 41. Perhaps that is why I cannot reason from the works to existence. If I call the works Napoleon's works, then the demonstration is superfluous, since I have already mentioned his name. If I ignore this, I can never demonstrate that the works, that they are Napoleon's, but demonstrate purely, ideally, that such works are the works of a great general. However, between God and his works, there is an absolute relation. God is not a name, but a concept. And perhaps because of that, his essentia involved extensium, his essence involves existence. So now we find ourselves in a different sort of tact. Cosmological arguments on the very basis are kind of result back into an ontological argument. And for this reason, don't always work. But if instead of talking about that God, we're talking about a God, then maybe we have a different starting point, right? To, to bring in Hume in his dialogues concerning natural religion, maybe we can learn something about what this would be. Maybe it's not exactly what we want to know. Maybe it can't be entirely known, but as a concept, Maybe there are things that are known. Maybe his essence involves his existence. And therefore, there is the possibility of God being understood as a concept, maybe along the lines of an unmoved mover, the, the first cause, this sort of thing, as opposed to other ideas that are more grandiose. So he, he's kind of turning you know, the, the idea of saying ontological arguments are not really that great, but maybe there's a possibility. Maybe there's something else that we can add into this. He wants to advance this idea a little bit in the footnote. He says, for example, Spinoza, who by immersing himself in the concept of God, aims to bring being out of the means of thought. But please note, as the accidental quality of the qualification of essence, this is the profundity of Spinoza, but let us see how he does it. Right, so he then goes into a larger discussion of what Spinoza ends up doing and ends up having some advantages and disadvantages of that. And if you're interested in this idea, right, you even get more continued on almost the entire page of 41 and some of 42, right? At the beginning of 42 in that footnote, he says, but as soon as I speak ideally about being, I'm speaking no longer 
uh, about being but about essence right and so this discussion between being and essence is being teased out here the necessary has the highest ideality therefore it is but the being is the essence whereby it expressly cannot become dialectical uh, in the determinants of this factual being because it is and neither can it be said to have more or less being a relation of something else right so that's sort of spinoza's argument and then he has a, another little line here if god is possible he's also necessary right this is an idea going back to leibniz right that uh we were having that discussion there how would we define something right if it's if it's possibility doesn't necessitate a contradiction then it, you can't say that it doesn't exist right so we can introduce this argument as well so we have a different sort of twist we have the door being closed on the arguments for the existence of god but yet not slammed shut not closing all the way there's still a gap there's still something that's going to allow somebody to proceed and understand a little bit more indeed this idea of maybe there's room for a proof for the existence of god is what he starts to move to on page 42. god's works therefore only the god can do some you can say that a work is only the work a man can do or only the work a, a horse can do or, or whatever right that maybe individuals you can't say did this but species we can address right this is the work of of this product or that product or something along these lines right. quite correct he says but then what are the god's works the works from which i want to demonstrate his existence do not immediately and directly exist not at all or are the wisdom and nature of the goodness or the wisdom and governance right in front of our noses do we not encounter the most terrible spiritual trials here and is it ever possible to be finished with all of these trials but i do not demonstrate god's existence from such an order of things and even if i begin i would never finish and also would be obliged continually to live in suspensio and suspension lest something so terrible happen that my fragment of demonstration would be ruined therefore from what works do i demonstrate it from the works regarded ideally that is as they do not appear directly and immediately but then i do not demonstrate it from the works after all but only develop the ideal ideality i have presupposed trusting in that once again we're returning to this argument from anselm right i even dare to defy all objects even those that have not yet arisen which is kind of a, a callback a little bit to Descartes as well. So we're, we're finding ourselves closing that door and now slowly opening it up, but not from the argument that God is then that which nothing greater can be conceived because that he's saying is almost an absurdity. But we have this presupposition, which we're going to just acknowledge. And then we're going to move on from there. By beginning then, I have presupposed the ideality. I have presupposed that I will succeed in accomplishing it. But what else is that but presupposing that the God exists and actually beginning with trust in Him? Right. So our our our, our proofs for the existence of God really start with the idea that we believe already that there is a God who exists. He's going to just kind of be upfront and honest, like this is how these things work. Yep, this is how we're doing it. And how does the existence of God emerge from the demonstration? Does it happen straight away? Is it not here as if the case with the Cartesian dolls? As soon as I let go of the doll, it stands on its head. As soon as I let go of it, consequently, I have to let go of it. Right. So what is a Cartesian doll? This is a, a good question. And there's a footnote on this. If you go into the back of the book on footnote 28, most of us don't think of something being a cartesian doll this isn't the name of a common toy here right but if we go in the back page 291 for those of you who raced over there and are trying to look for it it's 
an eccentrically weighted tumbler doll that rolls to its feet when released. Uh, it's misnamed for the so-called Cartesian Devil, which was a hollow glass figure weighted at, uh, and open on the bottom uh, and partially filled with air, which moves in a partially filled container of water uh, when the top of the container is pressed down. In other words, it's it's a it's it's a wobble, right? It's a it, it you know it's a weevil. It, it wobbles, but it doesn't fall down. It's it's weighted on the bottom, not at the top. You can every time you put it on its head, it, it rolls over. Uh, right? It, it's something that just happens because of the weighting of it. This is what the Cartesian doll is that he's addressing here. Um, right? So when will the doll? When will the weevil roll over from its head onto its feet? It'll do so when you let go of it. Consequently, you have to let go of it. Otherwise, it doesn't work. When do proofs for the existence of God work? When you let go of it, when you're no longer trying to prove the existence of God, when you just say, here's what it is. When it's not functioning as a proof, but as a discussion. Right? It's probably something that encounters a lot of you before in life, right? You know, as a child, you're playing with Legos. You get your big pile of Legos all out and you're trying to build something and you're looking for that one piece. And as long as you're looking for that piece, you, you can't find it. It's gone. You give up. Fine. I'm not going to worry about that piece. I'm going to work on a different part of whatever it is that I'm building. And what happens shortly thereafter? You find that piece that you were hunting for forever. Like the only way you were ever going to find it is by letting go of trying to find it, of moving your attention elsewhere, the same is being said here for proofs for the existence of God. It's it's that you got to let go of the weevil so it can wobble, so it can turn over to its feet. You have to let go of looking for Legos because otherwise you're not going to find that one piece, that one elusive piece. But it's there. You know it's there. And it'll be discovered once you're no longer looking for it. So also with the demonstration. So long as I'm holding on to the demonstration that has continued to be the one who's demonstrating, the existence does not emerge. For if no other reason than that I am the process of demonstrating it. But when I let go of the demonstration, the existence is there. Yet this letting go, even that is surely something. It is, after all, my contribution, my nazuhat. Does it not have to be taken into account? This diminutive moment, however brief it is, it does not have to be long, but it is a leap. Here we're getting the leap, the leap of faith, as it will also sometimes be identified as. And this is also something very important for Kierkegaard and his existentialism, the idea of the leap, that you can't know everything that at a certain point, you have to be brought to the edge of faith through reason, but then there's this leap. There's something that is beyond what is just known. And if we want to, you know, look back at this, you know, the medieval debate, for instance, of the primacy of faith versus reason, Kierkegaard is going to be a lot like Abelard. That to be a Christian is to be a logician, that it should be logical, it should be brought out. But sides also a little bit with Anselm that faith completes knowledge, that faith precedes knowledge, that we have to let go at a certain point. We have to be able to make this leap. We have to say, I can't control everything. This is where things look like they go. I'm going to just jump. And that is when you get to land. But you have to still leap. And it's a leap. Leaps aren't easy. This is what he's saying. However diminutive this moment, even if it is this very instant, this very instant must be taken into account. If someone wants to have forgotten it, I will have taken the occasion to tell a little anecdote in order to show that it does indeed exist. And he goes on and tells a story then. Uh, and then at the end of that paragraph on 43, he says, and that, of course, is how it really is. Trying to get rid of something by sleeping 
is just as useless as trying to obtain something by sleeping. Right? You, you can't get things through osmosis, as it were, right? Don't sleep on your textbooks and hope that gives you all the answers for the test, right? Therefore, next paragraph on 43. Anyone who wants to demonstrate the existence of God in any other sense than elucidating the God concept and without the ultimate reservation that we have pointed out, that the existence itself emerges from the demonstration by a leap Prove something else instead, at times, something that perhaps did not even need demonstrating, and in any case, never anything better. Right? So we, we can maybe challenge a little bit of Aquinas and, and look at Aquinas' uh, definitions here, right? We're, we're trying to demonstrate the existence of God, but really what we're doing is we're proving something else, that God is a first mover, an unmoved mover, right? the first cause, that sort of thing. And then, very clearly, a line back to Anselm, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But he who says in his heart, or to others, just wait a little, I shall demonstrate it. Ah, what a rare wise man he is. An idea of almost being a, a crazy comedy here, of the just wait, right? And later on, we'll end up getting other existentialist discussions on what it is to wait for this God, right? The, the work waiting for Godot comes about from this very sort of concept. But in that work, different sort of conclusion than what Kierkegaard is going to be arguing. If at the moment he is supposed to begin with the demonstration, it is not totally undecided whether the God exists or not, then of course he does not demonstrate it. And if that is the situation in the beginning, then he never, never does make a beginning. Partly for fear that he will not succeed because the God may not exist, and partly because he has nothing with which to begin. This is the sort of challenge that we find ourselves in, that we have to kind of accept something as it moves forward, even though we can't hold on to it. We can't decide that this is the case before we do it. We just have to wait. And that becomes the proof. What happens later when you let go? That you're now discussing the concept and then therefore the concept at least exists. And then what you do with that becomes a larger question. Is this a proof proof or just a demonstration or a definition? And then we're left with that whole question of the realm of ideas once again. Next paragraph down on 44, midway down, right? The paradoxical passion of the understanding is then continually colliding with this unknown. This is what we're trying to do. We're always encountering this unknown. And to that extent, does not exist because it's not known, right? The understanding does not go beyond this, yet in this paradoxically, the understanding cannot stop reaching it and being engaged with it because wanting to express its relation to it by saying that this unknown does not exist will not do since just saying that involves a relation. We can't say the unknown doesn't exist because now we're relating to a concept as an unknown. We're related to it. But what then is this unknown for does not its being the God merely signify to us that it is the unknown? We can see it here an interesting connection to, to later pragmatists uh, of the 19th century as well, right? William James uh, and others. The Are you going around the tree? Are you going around the squirrel or not, right? What is your relation to this paradox? In many ways, it, it, it doesn't matter that what truth is, is pragmatic truth. It's the fact that the unknown exists, and let us call the unknown God, it's only a name we give it, right, to go back to Kierkegaard here, but this becomes the way we're going to relate to the unknown for the fact that it's always on the forefront of our knowledge. The unknown is always what we're approaching and never able to get, because as soon as we've acquired something, it's now known. 
It's now a part of us, and yet our mind is still continually trying to think a thought which thought itself cannot think. So paradoxically, it's proved by the fact that we've never quite arrived. Pragmatically, it's there, even though it's not something that we can ever truly know. You have to just jump in there, that this becomes your idea of what things are moving forward. Bottom of 44 then, what then is the unknown? It is the frontier that is continually arrived at. And therefore, when the category of motion is replaced with the category of rest, it is the different, the absolutely different. So if we're not talking about it just being motion, we still want to refer to this as that object which is never quite arrived at. If we are at rest, then it is also at rest, right outside of ourselves. It is the different, the absolutely different. Again, the notion of different for other languages, right? To, to go back to just that, that linguistic analysis is, is the idea of holy. But it is the absolute different in which there is no distinguishing mark. Top of 45. Defined as the absolutely different, it seems to be the point of being disclosed, but not so because the understanding cannot even think the absolutely different. It cannot absolutely negate itself, but uses itself for the purpose and consequently thinks the difference in itself, which it thinks by itself. We're in this really odd position here, right? We can't know it because it's not knowable but yet we're engaged with it and therefore there's a transition that also takes place it cannot absolutely transcend itself and therefore thinks as above itself only the sublimity that it thinks by itself if the unknown the god is not solely the frontier then the one idea about the different is confused and the many ideas about the different the unknown is then this dispersion, and the understanding has an attractive selection from among what is available and what fantasy cannot think. But the difference cannot be grasped securely. Every time this happens is basically an arbitrariness, and the very bottom of devoutness there madly lurks, the capricious arbitrariness that knows it itself has produced the God. We have this weird sort of arbitrary craziness that it's something on the outside, there's something unknown, and therefore we're once again encountering this God as a concept, the works of which are only can be done by the God and therefore are only approached by the fact that it is unknown and only through the idea of a leap and letting go because it's a thought which thought itself cannot think because it's other, it's outside. And that is the very thing that we're trying to do. That is the aim of this thought project. In the realm of fantastical fabrication, paganism has been adequately luxuriant, right? You can end up confusing these differences and giving different ideas. And he says that this is what paganism does right it just assumes uh deification of, of different objects uh, but that's not where he's going to go with respect to the assumption just advanced which is the self-ironizing of the understanding i shall merely trace it a few lines without reference to whether it was historical or not there exists then a certain person who looks just like any other human being grows up as do other human beings marries has a job, takes tomorrow's livelihood into account as a man should. It may be very beautiful to want to live as the birds live in the air, but it is not permissible, and one cannot indeed end up in the saddest of plights, either dying of hunger, if one has to the endurance for that, or living on the goods of others. This human being is also the God. How do I know that? Well, I cannot know that, for in that case, I would have known the God and the difference, but I do not know the difference inasmuch as the understandings have made it like unto that from which it differs. 
Thus the God has become the most terrible deceiver through the understanding's deception of itself. The understanding has the God as close as possible and yet just as far away. There's this sort of weirdness tied in with this God, with this relation, with what we're doing, right? That we can't know anything firmly, but we're also going to know that it's it's kind of here because of these earlier discussions, because of the poetic venture that he took. He's going to kind of throw out this as an idea and say, well, how can I know what I can't know? In fact, it can't even be known. But maybe. And therefore, there's this spot for the leap once again. So on, maybe even you, may now be asking, I know full well that you are a caprice monger, which is just not really a, a term that we use much anymore, right? But you certainly do not believe that it would occur to me to be concerned about a caprice so curious or so ludicrous that it has probably never occurred to anyone, and above all, so unreasonable that I would have to lock everything out of my consciousness in order to think of it. That is exactly what you have to do. But then it is justifiable to want to keep all the presuppositions you have in your consciousness and still presume to think about your consciousness without any presuppositions. Most likely, you do not deny the consistency of what has been developed, that in defining the unknown as the different and understanding ultimately goes astray and confuses the difference with likeness. But this seems to imply something different, namely, that if a human being is to come truly to know something about the unknown, the God, he must first come to know that it is different from him, absolutely different from him. Right? This is the beginning of this discussion once again. How is it that you can know the God? You have to start off with the presupposition that it is different from you. It is the unknown. It is the object to which the learner wants to learn. He must first come to know that it is different from him, absolutely different. The understanding cannot come to know this by itself, since, as we have seen it in a contradiction, we've already addressed this idea. Your understanding can't know what it doesn't know. It's unknowable. But if something approaches it from the outside, gives it that knowledge, transforms it from not to be to to be, from untruth to truth, then it is knowable. That is the only way we can learn is to approach the object from the outside. This is the argument that's being made here. If it is going to come to know this, it must come to know this from the God. If it does come to know this, it cannot understand this and consequently cannot come to know this for how could it understand the absolutely different? If this is not immediately clear, then it will become more clear from the corollary. If the God is absolutely different from the human being, then a human being is absolutely different from the God. But how is the understanding to grasp this? At this point, we seem to stand at a paradox. Once again, we are back at this notion of the paradox wanting to think what thought itself cannot think, wanting to know the unknown. This is the whole venture of learning for Kierkegaard. If it's not recollection, the knowledge has to be something unknown, and yet how can we know what we don't know? It has to come to know us. It has to be found in a way that's approachable to us, and it has to be the one to initiate this. We have very much a lot of tinges of Bonaventure in his journey of the mind into God to this, right? Notions of apprehension. We can apprehend it, and yet then it comes to us. We, again, we're getting to draw on several different philosophers to arrive at this point. Just to come to know then that the God is the different. Man needs the God and then comes to know that the God is absolutely different from him. But if the God is to be absolutely different from a human being, this can have its basis not in that which man owes to the God, top of 47, but in which he owes to himself, or in that which he himself has committed. 
Right? There has to be a difference if it is indeed different. And therefore, we're left again with trying to understand where does this difference come from? How is it not just one and the same? What then is the difference? Indeed, what else but sin? Since the difference, the absolute difference, must have been caused by the individual himself. We have to have been rejecting this truth to be untruth. And so again, to go back to the earlier discussions, we have a further elaboration on the, this concept of sin and what it is in this philosophical standpoint. We stated this in the foregoing by saying that the individual is untruth. And is this through his own fault? We jestingly yet earnestly agreed that it is too much to ask himself to find this out himself. Now we have come to the same point again. Once again, without every one of these lines being truth, untruth, and these distinctions, we're arriving at this same point. The unknown must be outside, and this difference between what is known and unknown has to also be on us. And therefore, this individual is in the state of untruth of their own fault, we've arrived at once again. Midway through 47, the consciousness of sin which he could no more teach to any other person than any other person can teach it to him. Only the God can teach it, if he wanted to be teacher. But this he did indeed want to be, as we have already composed the story, what we did in chapter 2, right? And in order to be that, he wanted to be on the basis of equality with the single individual, so that he could completely understand him. Thus the paradox becomes even more terrible, or the same paradox has a duplexity by which it manifests itself as the absolute, negatively by bringing into the promise, uh, prominence the absolute difference of sin, and positively by wanting to annul this absolute difference in the absolute equality. So to make equal, there is also this unknown approaching itself and making it known. But is the paradox uh, such as this conceivable? We shall not have in a uh, be in a hurry. Once again, not in a hurry. We're just going through this, and this is just a thought project. This is just a pamphlet. We're not doing a lot here. We're not rushing. We're just kind of mulling ideas over. We're we're thinking of old philosophers. We're thinking of what would be the conclusions if we're not being Socrates. We're not in a hurry. We're just taking our time. But yet, you know, there is time, there is thoughts, there's things that we need. Whenever the contention is over, a reply to a question, the contending is not like that on a racetrack. It is not speed that wins, but correctness. The understanding certainly cannot think it, cannot hit upon it in its own. And if it is proclaimed, the understanding cannot understand it and merely detects that it will likely be its downfall. To that extent, the understanding has strong objections to it. And yet, on the other hand, in its paradoxical passion, the understanding does indeed will its own downfall. Once again, we're left with what the paradox is. The paradox is the loss of the self and the gaining of the other. It's moving from not to be to to be. It's moving from untruth to truth. There's a transformation. You're moving from about yourself to about the other in the act of the beloved. This is the process of learning. This is also the transformation of life in many ways. But the paradox too wills this downfall of the understanding and thus the two have a mutual understanding. But this understanding is present only in the moment of passion. This is also what we're doing, right? The paradoxical passion of the moment wills its own downfall and yet advances itself as well. Concluding on 48, we're left once again with this notion of love, right? And, and, and what it does in the same process of learning. Self-love, he says, lies at the basis of love, but at its peak, its paradoxical passion wills its own downfall. Erotic love also wills this and therefore these two forces are a mutual understanding in the moment of passion. And this passion is precisely 
erotic love. Why then should the lover not be able to think this, even though the person who in self-love shrinks from erotic love can neither comprehend it nor dare to venture into it, since it is indeed his downfall? So it is with the passion of erotic love. To be sure, self-love has foundered, but nevertheless, it is not annihilated, but is taken captive, and erotic's love spoils of war. But it can come to life again, and this becomes erotic's love spiritual trial. So also with the paradox's relation to the understanding, except that this passion has another name, or rather we must simply try to find a name for it. Learning and love are kind of the same thing. You're losing yourself by gaining something different, something that's outside of yourself, which you now then take within yourself, but remains outside of yourself. It's confusing. But again, this analogy helps it to make sense.